are back in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and I hope you've been blessed by this as much as I have. Um, in many ways, we're getting into the, the part of Paul's letter where he has established the foundation, and he's starting to bring specific charges against the church, and he's really just laying into them at <laughs> many points. Uh, not that they don't deserve it, or not that he is uh, exceeding his authority or his um, right as an apostle. All of this is the Holy Spirit speaking through the Apostle Paul and giving messages for the Corinthians, but also for all churches in all ages, um, in, in, every, in every century. So uh, we're going to deal tonight with the first half of chapter 6, which uh, is titled here in most Bibles, Lawsuits, Lawsuits Against Believers, and that's really the main topic, what we're dealing with tonight. But it does go a little bit further than that. Um, and verse 9 through 11, we'll see Paul gives one of his lists. There are several of these lists in the New Testament where he describes the type of people that will not be in the kingdom. So there is something more at stake here than just uh, dealing with the specific issues of lawsuits among believers. And I ultimately want to get to the bottom of that. But before we do, and I always forget to, let's read the text. So and we're going to read um, verse 1 through 11 of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Keep in mind as well as we read this, the context of chapter 5, the, the um, chapter breaks in Corinthians are, are not always very helpful, at least to understand um, the flow of Paul's argument. Because uh, if, we, if we were to think that, uh, that he was on to a completely different topic from what he was talking about before, in chapter 5, you'll remember that he talks about sexual immorality, and uh, you might think that's an odd transition to talking about lawsuits, but it, it does have the same foundation, and we're going to see that in verse 9 when we get there. So, let's read verse 1 through 11, 1 Corinthians 6. This is the word of God. When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous? instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to settle a dispute between the brothers, but brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud, even your own brothers. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Well, a lawsuit, as we probably know, is a situation where two people cannot agree on a matter and they decide to go to court to settle it before a judge. Inevitably, this is going to happen in, um, among Christians. Um, Christians are going to have issues where, uh, with the world, where the world defrauds them and cheats them. And um, we have every right to stand up for stolen property and uh, injury to... Um, you know, our, our livelihood and things like that. Uh, when it comes to the world doing us wrong, we have every right to, as Jesus said, use unrighteous mammon or unrighteous means to be righteous, to do good. And uh, we, we have every biblical right to use the system, even the perverted system that the world uh, works, as long as we do not sin and break the commandments, but to use 
the, the systems and structures that the government has put in place to uh, rectify things that uh, rectify injustices. Um, yet there is a special stipulation here. There's a special warning against going to court with other believers. And that might seem a little bit too prohibitive to us because you think, well, sometimes Christians have problems with other professing Christians. It's not inherently wrong to have a disagreement in the church and even to stand up for your rights before another believer if you feel another believer has done you wrong. And yet what Paul is saying is that there is a process to doing that that is very different from the process here. I didn't do a lot of research on the uh, the the backdrop to uh, you know the, the situation in Corinth at the time, but I did do a little, um, and just generally, lawsuits at that time were were uh, extremely diverse in their nature, kind of like today, um, but they weren't all all quite as much focused on just getting the exact amount of money that you wanted out of it. If we go to small claims court for three thousand dollars or something like that. Um, that's maybe a modern example of a lawsuit um, that, that, we might, that might jump to our mind here. And in that transaction, if you are going to small claims court, you stand before the judge um, equal to the other person, and the judge makes a decision. And the decision basically is, if you win, you get the $3,000, and if you lose, you have to pay the $3,000. And then the people walk away and go back to their lives, sometimes even shake hands and get back to uh, their relationships again. But the situation in Corinth seemed to be at that time that um, people from lower classes actually could not sue people from higher classes in the Greco-Roman world. Um, and so it was only people from high, higher classes that could actually bring a lawsuit against lower classes, or people of equal class could sue each other. So what this means is that somebody who was poor essentially could get no justice if a richer person had wronged them. As well, the lawsuits seem to be more uh, about destroying another person's reputation and, it's in a sense, waging war against their, their reputation and trying to, to um, uh, end their status in society. We know that this was much more of a shame-based culture, and uh, as we talked about, uh, in the past few weeks, the shame in, in, in our modern society is, is hardly there at all. So going to, even going to court with somebody, um, being accused of that would, would certainly destroy someone's reputation. By the time it reached the magistrate, it was like publishing this, that uh, this person was, was no good to do business with. So... And that's all on the surface, and then there's corruption on top of that, and you end up with a very um, corrupt system that was not favorable to uh, a lot of the poor people that made up the Corinthian church. And he's saying then, you're dragging other believers into this system. Paul does not pull any punches here when he describes what the judges of the world are like. He says, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Paul wasn't necessarily disrespecting the wisdom of the Greco-Roman magistrates, judges. He wasn't necessarily saying they're bad judges even. But they're fundamentally unrighteous, and that's what we really need to see beneath all of this. The problem here is not so much that you're standing up for your rights, it's that you're taking your complaint to someone who does not even believe in the God of the universe that Christians believe in. Furthermore, you're taking the name of Christ, which should be all about forgiveness and peace and mercy. That's the command that he's given us to do to, do to one another, to forgive one another, and you're dragging that name through the mud. So that's really the first implication. I want to go through several implications, uh, negative implications that uh, Paul is hitting here that uh, for Christians who choose to sue each other. So just several points, probably in order of the least important to most important. The first one is that we are called to live at peace with one another. 
that should seem obvious to us. But that's said repeatedly in Paul's letters. He calls on um, uh, all the believers to do that. He even names names. Sometimes it says, tell Euodia and Syntyche to stop fighting and get along. And Paul says at, at certain points that, um, you know, this, this, this discord, this argument is, is ruining Christ's name. We're called to live at peace. And again, this doesn't mean that we never disagree, but that our, dis- that, that our disagreements on non-essential issues really should, we should defer to one another out of love on those things. If we have a major doctrinal disagreement, of course, let's, 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 uh, let's hash it out in a respectful way. But when it comes down to, well, he, he cheated me out of $100 or $1,000, or, you know, whatever the situation may be. Paul's answer to that is, isn't it better to be defrauded? Isn't it better to be wronged? And I want to get to that verse, too. And and that one has always stuck in my head. Because, you know, some part of our flesh jumps out and says, no, I don't want to be defrauded. That's terrible. I I, I wonder if it's an American thing, too, but we're, we're... you know, trained to not be doormats, to, to assert ourselves and to stand up for our rights and to say, no, you can't walk over me. I'm an independent American. It seems almost unpatriotic to say, let yourself be defrauded. Let yourself be wronged. But in the kingdom of love, in the kingdom of God's love, and that isn't to say that justice is not part of his kingdom. It is. But we are called to love one another. And Paul even says this great verse. He says, let no debt remain outstanding accept the debt of love that you owe to one another. And so we're always supposed to be in debt, acting as if we are in debt to each other. Like, like we can never pay enough love. We can never forgive enough. Because truly we have not, um, we cannot forgive as much as we have been forgiven. That debt must remain outstanding. So in such th- this kingdom, there could be hardly any room for lawsuits. That's the first. We're called to live at peace with each other. The second implication is that we ourselves are already judged. We are already judged. He says that back in chapter 5. I'm always looking at a different Bible than the one I have at home. <laughs> I should get a copy of the ESV here. But um, <clears throat> Paul said that he himself is judged. No one judges him. It might have been chapter 4. But, but he said, no one judges me. I, am, I, I am, self, am judged alone by God, and I already stand judged. And that's what we're celebrating this morning. And that's what we're celebrating, you know, should be celebrating every day, is that our, our justification, our status before God is perfection because of Christ. So there is nothing that, that can be um, held against us So why would we drag our brother into court who makes the same profession? We are judged, and we are judged free, innocent, and righteous. So why would we drag another believer into that court if his standing is perfection? Why not forgive as we have been forgiven? The parable of the wicked master ought to always terrify us. It's one of the most terrifying in Scripture. And anyone who claims that Jesus never said anything like the Old Testament has not read the New Testament. Um, Jesus talks about uh, taking the wicked servant and tearing him to pieces, the parable of the talents. Jesus is very severe about people who refuse to forgive. And that ought to terrify us, not in the sense that we think we can lose that salvation that we have assurance of but what does it mean for somebody who professes to be a believer but does not forgive what does that mean it's a sobering thought we are already judged we are judged perfect we still need to confess our sins to each other but the issue or the the way of resolution of that is is that very way we go to each other and we confess our sins and we work it out and we'll get into that also how, uh, what we can do instead of going to court as believers. So, we are judged, 
And third, we ourselves are judges. And that's Paul's greater point here. We ourselves are not only declared innocent as uh, the, the, uh, what's the, the, uh, the defendant, as the defendant, we have been declared, uh, declared free and innocent, but we're also going to be sitting in the judge's seat. And in some way, we kind of are right now. Paul seems to put this in the future, especially here. He says, we will judge the world. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? I always love that he phrased that as a question. It, it indicates he's probably told them this before. Or they should understand this before based on something that Jesus had said or the other apostles had said. In fact, Jesus did say that. He told his disciples that they would sit on 12 thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. There's an interesting uh, uh, reference in Revelation 2. I didn't write in my notes also, but let's see if I can just find that really fast. Revelation chapter 2. Verse 26, he's talking to the church at Thyatira, and he says, The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with the rod of iron, as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. That's, does anyone recognize what, what, what that's quoting in the Old Testament? That's quoting Psalm 2, the Messianic Psalm, which says that, ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, and you will rule them with a, with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And this is Jesus talking to the church at Thyatira, and he says, the one who conquers and endures until the end who keeps my works until the end, I will give him the authority over the nations to rule them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces. Even as I myself has received authority. So Jesus is going to take the authority that he's been given and share that with us. Just as we share in the inheritance with him of salvation and the blessings of heaven and the inheritance of the earth, we also share in the authority and the rulership of the earth. I don't ever think about myself ruling the nations with a rod of iron. <laughs> it's not a category I think about. But Paul is asking us to think about that a little bit. Back in Corinthians 6, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? See, we are a kingdom of priests and we're also a kingdom of judges. We are all competent to judge what he calls trivial cases. He says even in verse 3, do you not know that we are to judge angels? I always say to that verse, no, Paul, I didn't know that. I don't remember in the New Testament where it said that. But he must have been speaking this uh, to the Corinthians. This must have been the teaching of the apostles. And anyway, we have it right here. If you didn't know, now you know. How much more, then, matters pertaining to this life? In what, in what way are we going to judge angels? Well, it's a little mysterious, I suppose, but we have some insight. We know that uh, the fallen angels are really the ones that stand in judgment. We certainly will be able to testify against the fallen angels when we stand before the Lord or with the Lord and say, yes, these demons persecuted us day and night. Satan and his demons did that. We, we can testify to that. And we can say that his judgment of them is righteous and true. I don't know in any sense that there's any sense in which we will be judging the, um, the righteousness or unrighteousness of the holy angels because they are perfectly righteous. There's nothing to judge there. So I think he's referring specifically to the angels that, that deserve judgment. It also, the sense of the word here may be uh, in a sense of rulership. 
and humans will be, um, because of Christ, will be over the angels ultimately. And that's a phenomenal thought. Because Psalm 8 says that we, we were made a little bit lower than the angels. But through Christ, we have been exalted above the angels. So all of that, you know, Paul's great at laying these, these really solid theological foundations to, to make you just think, wow, I guess the, the issue of going and suing another believer is kind of ridiculous when you think about that. When you refocus, and I'm glad Dave said it this morning, you know, refocusing our, our attention on what Paul said, that all things are ours, everything. He said that at the end of chapter 3. Let's go back there, 1 Corinthians 3. Paul's using all these rhetorical questions, like in verse 16 of chapter 3. He says, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? That's one of those other incredible bedrock truths. You know, rather than just, than just saying, well, don't do this and do that and don't do that, Paul says, don't you realize who you are? All, so verse 21, for all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ and Christ is God's. If you meditate on that truth just a little bit, Suing a brother over $500 or $1,500 or $50,000 seems minuscule. You are going to inherit the entire universe. You are going to be master of all of it. Does a lawsuit make any sense from that perspective? This might be a strange analogy, so I'll just go off on a... Uh, on a tree limb here, but I, it just made me think of this. When I play games with my children, especially my young kids, the older they get, the less I'm going to let them win, right? But when I play games with my kids, I don't run up the score. They're probably going to start beating me at certain games. Um, I think my son can already beat me at chess. Pretty, probably true. But when I play game, games with my kids, I don't run up the score. You know, you let them win, when they're, especially when they're really young. What kind of father is going to, to beat his five-year-old daughter 137 to zero at basketball. What would we say about a man like that? That he's a winner? Give him a, a trophy? Have a parade for him? The entire house is his. The ball, the food, the money. Even his daughter is his. All things are yours. Why would you get a prize? Why would we celebrate you? We would say that's a pathetic man that, that, that takes all of that privilege and choose to focus on that one single element of superiority and of, and of power. Everything's is. So what does it say when Christians appear before the world's judges in conflict and strife? They're looking at us and saying, I thought you were the religion of radical forgiveness. What is that about? So what do we do, rather than? When Christians have any kinds of disagreements, we must always take great care to see how we appear before the pagans. Jesus said, let your light shine among men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I always like that little part at the end, who is in heaven, by the way. I always thought, why did, he, why did he add that? And this might be a little speculation, but I think he, he, he specified your father who is in heaven because he wanted to remind them, your father's not here right now among you. Let your light shine among men so that they may glorify the father who is up in heaven you are the picture of the Father here on earth to them. You are showing them what God looks like because they can't see him. He's up in heaven. Peter takes Jesus' words there and echoes that and says in 1 Peter 2, Live such good lives among the pagans that although they may accuse you of doing evil, they may glorify God on the day he visits us. And I always think, when he says that, I always think of Christ before Pilate. You know, what, what more righteous life could you have led? And still they're going to accuse you of evil. They still accused him. 
But even then, the people who accused him, some of them did say this was the Son of God. So the idea is that the world is watching us far more than we know, or frankly, that we would even like. Christians are more highly scrutinized and criticized than any other group, and with each passing month, it's getting worse. We are the scum of the earth, after all, as Paul said. Satan hates the church more than any other nation. And yet there's something about truth that's impossible to ignore. They may hate us even though they can't find any fault with us. In fact, that may be the reason they hate us the most. And yet, truth is impossible to ignore. And there's a remnant from the world that will be saved and preserved by our standing up for the truth. Because God uses the means of our good works to win them over. So we need to care then how we appear before the world. That's not always intuitive. We might always think like, you know, again, this is something that's promoted in our culture. Don't care what anyone else says about you. Just, you just focus on you. Well, there's probably strands of truth in that, depending on how you take that. But the Bible calls us to pay attention to how we're living before the world. How does the world think about us? Now, we can't control if they choose to accuse us falsely. But we do have a responsibility to show the world that Christians love each other. If we do not fear God, if we do not, excuse me, if we do not fear, yeah, if we do not, if we do not fear the name of God, rather, I think one of the greatest weaknesses of American Christianity is that, is that there's no fear of the name of God anymore. There's no fear of the reputation of God. We don't talk a lot about God's reputation and the church's reputation. And again, we're not a society that greatly values shame or appearance or, or reputation we're not a society that, bo- that, that honors the bond of a man's word anymore. The book of Proverbs has so much to say about the word of a man, meaning his reputation. How does he appear before the public? And how we are to take great care to, 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 to polish and preserve our good reputation and good name as much as we can. We've been taught, I think, Uh, partly because we've been taught subjective truth in schools for the last 40 years or 50 years. We've undermined the authority of expert teachers and historical witnesses. So the very idea of an honorable teacher, of an honorable witness is is lost um, in in just a mire of he said and she said and we think and we speculate. Also, notice in our commercial dealings anymore, we don't really do a lot of verbal contracts. People's reputations are not enough currency anymore to to get the job done. Everything is written out in contracts. We fundamentally don't trust each other. That's the society we live in. And people make very successful livings selling their dignity, selling their good name for cheap. And all of this is to say that when the Old Testament writers spoke of the name of God, the reputation of God being great among the nations, they weren't talking about a cheap sort of publicity that we might think of today. They were talking about God's integrity, his identity, his very self. Indeed, a man's name in the ancient world was tantamount to his business, his credit score, the free association of himself and his family and society. Essentially, a man's name, his reputation, was his passport to a civilized life. And so if his name was ruined, he would lose all he had. His money, his career, his social status, maybe even his family. And that's why Solomon can say that a good name is better than silver and gold. Money comes and goes, but your reputation is far more difficult to restore when it's been ruined. So what is the name of Christ that we bear 
What is the status of that before the world? What is the status of the name of God? You can do a fascinating study of the Old Testament just looking at, at how from Moses to uh, the prophets, the later prophets, how they all pleaded with God to, pr to honor and, pr and preserve and to glorify his great name. And then going down to Jesus, says, glorify your name. And God says, I have, the Father says, I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The, their, their concern throughout the entire Old Testament into the New Testament is the reputation of God. And that's why fundamentally lawsuits against believers are a terrible thing, not because we're, um, you know, necessarily standing up for our rights in the church and maybe pointing out something that was done wrong, but the fact is that they were actively trying to destroy each other's reputations and in the process, the reputation of the church and by extension, the name of Christ was dragged through the mud. God fulfills promises for his own glory and for the sake of his good name. We are saved here tonight. We are standing here, sitting here, because he is concerned with his name. The Bible says to avoid even the appearance of evil, not just evil itself, but the appearance of evil. We need to make sure that other people are looking at us and they're making as good conclusions as they can. And as much as they hate us and want to make false accusations, that's their business. But the name of Yahweh is good. It's an absolute good. And the good God wants to preserve it, celebrate it, promote it, because that is the greatest of goods himself. The greatest good in the universe is for God to love himself. And we should thank God that we have a God that loves himself because he is good. And he wants that, his name, to be great among the nations. Rather than going to court, settle it with your brother. The process for that, we don't have time to look at it, but is in Matthew 18. Jesus says, take your issue to your brother. Try to settle it with him individually. If he will not listen to you, and if he does listen to you, you've won your brother. And that process is over. It doesn't need to go before anyone else. If it, um, <clears throat> if it doesn't work, then you get couple of witnesses to go with you and try to sort it out. And this whole time we're supposed to be trying to win back our brother with love, not just pointing a finger and accusing him to say, hey, here's our situation. We need to resolve this. And finally, if that does not work, you take it before the entire church and try to resolve the situation then. In most cases, that, that will work. I think the problem is just that we just don't ever do that process. We don't ever sit down and communicate. A couple of more loose ends here before we get to conclude with, with verse 9. There's a key phrase here also that kind of indicates what was going on in Corinth. And that is when he says in verse 7, Why not rather be defrauded, but you yourselves wrong and defraud? even your own brothers. So he's not talking about going back and, and getting the $500 that are, you're rightfully owed, necessarily. He's talking about frivolous lawsuits or even aggressive lawsuits that are designed to destroy your brothers, to steal from them. And that leads into verse 9 and explains how this list of evil is connected with the lawsuits and is connected with the man who is uh, with his father's wife, even. If the lawsuit seem, thing seemed out of place, like, oh, well, that's a sort of minor vice, I suppose, compared to what we just saw. No, they're trying to destroy their brother's reputation. They're trying to actively ruin their lives. And we can only speculate about why that would be, but there's sin in the church. There's evil in the church. It needs to be purged. So he says, and see if you can, as we read the list again in 9.10, see if you can find who he's talking about here. And he, he brings in the, uh, a lot of sexual sin as well, which we'll conclude chapter 6 by talking about. So you see this is all flowing as one, one argument here. 
because he's going to be talking about that for the next couple of chapters, in fact. So verse 9, again, he says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, well, that covers the person he was talking about before, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, yes, it's in the Bible, at many different points, as clear as day, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. The issue wasn't people, it wasn't just, I want to say that too, it wasn't just people going and getting a few hundred dollars or a few thousand dollars that they are rightfully owed. It was people going out and trying to swindle and deceive their fellow brothers. He says they're, they're not even going to inherit the kingdom. They're not even brothers. So Paul is sort of talking to two different groups here it, within the church, which there will always be, the sheep and the goats. He's warning the goats and saying that you may not even be part of this church if you are greedy, if you are a swindler. But if you are taking your brother to court and trying to get what's rightfully yours, he reminds them, think about what already is yours. All things are yours. And, and think about God's good name. I think one of the greatest questions that I've heard that sums us all up nicely is that <clears throat> the greatest, one of the greatest questions and in, in, in summaries of what the Christian life, especially relationships between brothers and sisters is, it's very simply this. Is there anything between us that Christ didn't die for? If there is anything that Christ didn't die for between us, then Christ's death was a waste of time. And if there isn't, then you must forgive. Jesus said he will not forgive anyone who does not forgive his brother from his heart. Let's, let's pray. Lord, I ask for your help to do that. These are... Um, Tough words every time I think of them. You remind me of the parable of the selfish master, the unforgiving servant. <clears throat> help us, Lord. We need your help to forgive. Our first instinct in the flesh is to get revenge, retribution. Nobody wants to be swindled or defrauded any more than anyone wants to pick up their cross and be crucified. It's completely opposite of what this world is telling us. But we take heart because you have overcome the world. And you have given us a spirit that, the, the, the Holy Spirit. Uh, and with that spirit, our spirits have courage and, and have humility. Thank you, Lord, that you promised that the meek will inherit the earth. That when others do wrong to us, we are to leap for joy. Because great is our reward in heaven. Lord, help us to remember and just thank you for the truth that all things are ours. Life or death, all things are ours because we are Christ and Christ is God's. So, thank you for your word. Help us to remember it and take it with us as we go this week. In Jesus' name.